You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Garrett Levine and returning guest, Daryl Seligman. Garrett Levine is an astronomy PhD student at Yale University. He graduated from Caltech in the physics and planetary science options in 2018, then worked in mathematical finance until beginning graduate school in fall of 2020. He primarily studies topics relating to planetary astrophysics and has researched solar system bodies exoplanets, and interstellar objects. Dr. Daryl Seligman completed his undergraduate degrees in mathematics and physics at UPenn in 2015 and his PhD at Yale University in Astronomy in 2020. He was a TC Chamberlain Fellow at the University of Chicago Department of the Geophysical Sciences after completing his PhD. He is currently at Cornell and will be a Simonier NSF Scholar an NSF Astronomy and Astrophysics Postdoctoral Fellow with particular contributions to the Vera C. Rubin Observatory's Legacy Survey of Space and Time. Did you know when a quantum computer can outperform a digital computer at a specific task? It's known as quantum supremacy. Our producer Ross has been using Blinkist to go through and get the key ideas from books by Michio Kaku. In Quantum Supremacy, Dr. Kaku traces the history of the modern computer and posits a future in which quantum computing takes on the challenges of humanity that are unsolvable with even the most powerful of modern supercomputers. The amazing thing about Blinkist is despite how busy Ross is with producing Event Horizon, he can still use blinks to either listen to or read complex ideas in a short amount of time. The Blinkist app enables you to understand the most important things from over 6,600 non-fiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. We're happy to share with you products that we like and use on Event Horizon, so with that in mind, we encourage you to subscribe to Blinkist. Get your 40% off Blinkist annual premium and start your 7-day free trial by clicking the link in the description box or by scanning the QR code. Garrett Levine and Daryl Seligman, welcome to the program and welcome back, Daryl. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for having us. Now, gentlemen, today is an interesting day because the primary mirror of the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, is getting silvered in preparation to mount it and begin calibrating the instrument, hopefully, to begin science operations in 2025. And these operations are gonna be unique because this being a survey telescope, it's going to take periodic snapshots of the night sky that it can see and the entire sky and do it, I think every, what, 1.4 days, something like that, which is going to give us an advantage in finding interstellar objects, things like Oumuamua and Borisov, but probably many more of them. So what are the numbers here? What do you expect before going into this research, the active observation part of it? How many interstellar objects do you estimate we're going to see with this thing per year? So, yeah, the LSST is a really exciting all-sky survey. It has this sort of unique combination of being a wide survey where it can observe the whole sky and a, a fast survey where it can move from one field to the other very quickly and deep as well. So it sees very faint things. And so if you just kind of do a back of the envelope calculation, LSST should cover about the same search volume, or it should be sensitive to about the same amount of volume for interstellar objects in one year as PanSTARRS has been in about 10. And so if you do that estimate sort of back of the envelope, it seems as though LSST could see around an interstellar object or even more per year, which is a really exciting time for this field. Now, these are largely going to be comets, but I wanted to ask about asteroids, actual asteroids, instead of an outgassing comet. So we should be able to see those as well. So we really have sort of two classes of object here that we could potentially see, even though they're related somewhat, right? Yeah, that's that's right. So 
something that we've really come to appreciate, I think, is scientists who study solar system objects over the past several years is that activity and cometary activity really kind of exists on a continuum. Like we, we do see very bright active comets and we see very like inactive asteroids, but there's been all sorts of interesting discoveries, especially recently with objects that don't really conform to those definitions so well. Oumuamua, of course, being one of them where it kind of looked like an asteroid in the images, but it moved like a comet. There's active asteroids, there's centaurs, there's Manx, there's Manx objects as well. And so I think that what one of the benefits of LSST and seeing potentially a dozen or so interstellar objects is that we get to probe this continuum, not only in our solar system, but we get to see that continuum of activity for objects that originated from outside of the solar system as well. You know, what's going to be interesting is is the comet hunters for people that are searching for long period comets in the solar system itself. Well, you had to run across them before. Some amateur with a telescope finds a comet coming in. But now we're going to know about a great many of them well before they get here. So that's an, another interesting area of the, of the LSST is that it, it can do solar system research as well including potentially finding Planet Nine if it's out there. Now, with these interstellar comets, so Borisov looked a little bit boring. It looked like a solar system comet, but was there anything about that object that sort of played into your work that maybe these things act a little bit differently than solar system comets usually do? Yeah, I mean, something interesting about Borisov is that although it face value kind of looked like a solar system comet, it was enriched in what some people call hypervolatiles. So there were ices that were detected that were outgassing and causing the dust coma and the accelerations, like carbon monoxide was one of those. And typically in comets, you don't, you see a lot more water than carbon monoxide or even carbon dioxide. And carbon monoxide is a lot easier to remove. So the fact that Borisov had that and actually kind of looks like an outlier compared to the solar system comets potentially tells you that it originated in a different environment than those that are left in the solar system. And very naively, if it has hypervolatiles, that means A, it probably didn't spend much time close to its host star, but B, it maybe even formed at much further distances than the comets in the solar system. So we might even be able, we'll have to find more of these objects to kind of quantify this statement, but these interstellar comets at least could be telling us about a totally new type of comet than what we see in typically in the solar system, those that get ejected as opposed to those that get left. So tell us about the carbon monoxide frost line. What governing factor does that have on how a comet is? So the concept of like these ice lines, carbon monoxide being one of them, it's the idea that if you are a cloud and then disk of gas and dust that's surrounding a star that's forming, at some point, right, you get far enough away from the star that you freeze out water, for example, at around the distance where Jupiter is today. Uh, if you go further out beyond where Neptune is, then you start to freeze things like CO or carbon monoxide. And so the simplest model where things, sort of, where comets and asteroids, whatever is forming, incorporate whatever is solid in the region that they're forming. That means if they form past the water ice line, but before the CO ice line, the baseline model would say that you get water ice, but you don't get CO because CO was still gas when that solid object was forming. And so this idea of an ice line or Borisov having CO, the again, the baseline assumption would be that Borisov may have formed in a region where CO ice was able to freeze, which it doesn't seem like many of our solar system comets might have followed that paradigm. So even though in the images, Borisov looked a lot like solar system comets, when you take a closer look, it's also kind of an oddball. It would have been an outlier on our solar system comet scale. So an outlier as well. And obviously, Umomo was a huge outlier. A lot of really strange things with that one. Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the idea that it actually accelerated, or, you know, a non-zero acceleration, so it probably was outgassing, though it didn't really look like a comet doing so. As a matter of fact, I don't think they detected anything 
that it was outgassing. So what are the constraints here? I mean, what can you see just by using a telescope like LSST or other instruments? What can you tell about the chemical makeup just from sitting down here on Earth? And what can't you see? Well, I guess uh, one thing that's exciting right now is we're in a, we're much more prepared for these objects than we were several years ago when Oumuamua was discovered. Because we'll have LSST, which should discover a bunch more of those objects. But if you start finding interstellar comets and interstellar inactive comets or interstellar objects like Oumuamua, we also have JWST. And JWST, if we could point at something that seems inactive, would be much more sensitive to detecting things like carbon monoxide coming off of it, which you wouldn't even see typically. I see. So it's, it's, we're, we're, be, we're in a better, better position now. And obviously JWST was not operational yet or launched when Oumuamua came through. Now, what is a dark comet, Garrett? So this is actually probably something that Daryl can, should speak to as well. But I guess the simplest definition of a dark comet is that it is it looks like an asteroid in images you you don't see dust activity or you don't see any evidence of outgassing volatiles but then as you alluded to with a muamua you see in its trajectory that it accelerates non-gravitationally on the sky and so there's clearly something happening that's pushing the pushing the comet one way or another pushing the object one way or another but we just can't see it but I think Daryl was the one who actually may have kept, come up with the name. So Daryl should also <laughs> add to this as well. Yeah, I mean, maybe another good name is some people were like, why'd you call it a dark comet? Maybe you should call it a dim comet and make it less exciting sounding. It's important to note also that these non-gravitational accelerations, there are mechanisms that we have observed by which asteroids that do not have cometary activity whatsoever accelerate non-gravitationally. So... There's things like radiation pressure or the Yarkovsky effect. So these are all effects that are not related to ices that are outgassing, but are due to solar photons. So radiation pressure will be solar photons hit the surface of an asteroid and very gently push the asteroid away from the sun. For typical kind of densities and properties of asteroids, that's a very, very subtle, weak effect. And then another effect that's related but separate is this Yarkovsky effect, which is the surface of the asteroid will also heat up. But as it heats up, it then re-radiates. And asteroids are typically spinning rather rapidly. So it's re-radiating in all different directions. And that can, that can also cause asteroids to both spin up and accelerate. So we have known for many years that asteroids accelerate non-gravitationally as well. But the point with the dark comets and Oumuamua was that they were accelerating in such directions and magnitudes, that is, they were accelerating so strongly that they could not be explained by those effects that we see on asteroids. So really the only thing that we had come up with to explain the dark comets and Oumuamua was if, it's, if they have typical properties of asteroids, these accelerations are inconsistent with being from radiation-based effects. So what's left is outgassing, but there's no dust coma. So it's very strange. Could it though be situational? In other words, when Oumuamua was outgassing, nobody happened to be looking at it and it just ran out of volatiles, you know, had a pocket or whatever, and that outgassed. And then when they looked, they didn't see it because it had already ended. Is that possible for that object? Yeah, that, that's definitely, that is something that we looked at. It's something that is allowable by the data, but it's not preferred. Yeah, I should say, Jared and I wrote a paper about this, so Jared's the perfect <laughs> Yeah, it's, person it's definitely not preferred by the data, It's but it's not preferred, but it's also not ruled out by the data. So it's kind of like invoking the like shy Oumuamua hypothesis is something <laughs> that you can do, but I guess there's... Yeah, there's there's no way to rule that in or to rule that out. The simple model where it's continuously outgassing is just as as likely with the with the astrometry data. The, that is the positions of a muamua on the sky, as is the like impulse where it just kind of there there was a one burn, if you will. So they're they're both equally preferred by the data, and so yeah, there there's nothing unfortunately we can do to resolve that now that a muamua is gone. But that's something we could also look for in 
future either these dark comets within the solar system or future interstellar objects as well. Yeah, I mean, we can look at the dark comets now because they're native to the solar system. The idea, right, also I think important to note is they could be just outgassing and not producing a dust coma for whatever reason. So typically when you see a comet, what you're seeing is it's outgassing, but then along for the ride is a bunch of dust either from the surface or from the ice itself that's being dragged along in those a very certain size range, about micron sized dust particles reflect solar photons. And that's what give you those beautiful coma. But if you think about it, there is a unavoidable bias in up till now our ways of discovering comets because we always detected comets from their coma. So if there are comets out there that don't have dust coma, but are have ices and are actively sublimating for whatever reason without dust, we wouldn't really have seen them until these non until these non gravitational accelerations can show maybe that that's what's going on. But those are also very subtle effects and hard to discover. Much it's much harder to discover the non gravitational accelerations of comets than the cometary activity due to the coma. Now, with that coma, say a dustless comet, how would that come to be? In other words, we look at solar system comets, and obviously we see them as dusty and and gases, you know, volatiles and all that sort of thing, ices. But here it would be an object that would be mostly ice, right? So what would form an object like that without any dust? That's, that's a million dollar question. So unfortunately, the answer is we have no idea right now because we don't have, uh, we've just discovered these dark comets and I'm trying very hard to get follow up observations, but there are so many small bodies that are known about and tracked. We don't have very deep sensitive data on any given object. One possibility, this is just, and I, I'll caveat this with saying, this is just me telling a story. This is, there's definitely not, this definitely isn't necessarily correct, but one possibility, it did, we did notice that these dark comets, the few that we had measured their spins or their rotation, they were moving extremely quickly, rotating extremely quickly. So there's an object, 1998 KY26, which is about 15 meters in radius, and it rotates every 10 minutes. So one possibility is that this thing is an almost dead comet. So it used to be a much brighter comet and it had dust blown off, but previous generations of activity basically took all of the dust off of the surface. And now what's left is you have this really rapidly rotating thing, which is very weakly outgassing and there's no dust left. Hmm, that's interesting. So it's just basically shedding its dust and over time it would just shed all of it especially if you have billions of years <laughs> of rotation. Now, with the dark comets, what do we expect to find as far as the composition goes? In other words, does that, that process of losing the dust also change the actual makeup of the comet and make it anomalous as opposed to a normal one as far as the ices go? I'm going to have another unfortunate storytelling answer because I think your guess is as good as mine at this point. So... It's completely unconstrained. We have no idea right now, but there are lots of different hypotheses that we could test with better data. So really, I want to wait till we get better data to say anything definitive. I'm, an exciting thing is that the Hayabusa 2 mission is, is going to KY26, that one dark comet in 2031. So we're going to have much better data soon. It's possible. I mean, the one hypothesis that we've mostly talked about in the papers is that it's just H because H2O is the most typical thing water is seen in most comets it's just h2o very weakly outgassing but you run into some issues like if there was h2o on the surface if it's re if it's been close to the sun for a long time as you said it should have run out of h2o at this point especially if it's 15 meters in size so there are many other ways that an object could outgas that we could speculate about but right now it's just entirely an open question which i think is really ex makes it really exciting it does, but it gets even more exciting because these are not time capsules, although they technically are, but they're they're literally the Milky Way throwing us material from other star systems to look at and try to characterize and see how it differs from what we have here. Garrett, what is the future of that? In other words, are, can we tell from an interstellar object by collecting data on it as it passes through? Can we tell the conditions of its formation and where in its star system it might have originated from? Yeah, so I, I think that that's kind of, that is, you're, you're hitting at the question that we would like to know with any, as you say, gift that the Milky Way gives us in terms of interstellar objects. 
as we talked about before, you can sort of use these baseline models of the ice line to take a guess or to start to put together the picture of where an object like Borisov, for example, may have come from. You can say that with CO, it could either have come from a lower mass star that's cooler than the sun, or it could have come from further out in the disk of a sun-like star. Those are both very uh, reasonable hypotheses that you could make about that object. But you're exactly right. As we start to find more of these interstellar objects, and most of the goal of the follow-up observations, as Daryl was talking about with James Webb, for example, would really be to try to understand what planetary systems those came from and what were the characteristics of everything else that was in the system that it came from as well. Now, in regards to comets in general, there's obviously one very interesting feature is that there's carbon going on and amino acids even in certain meteorites that are linked with comets. So we, if we see that with a with a, you know one of these dark comets or anything like that, anything that has rocky material wouldn't really be a dark comet. But anyway, they you know we would know that the building blocks of life pervade the galaxy or not. So is that on the table, or would we have to actually go out and get samples of one of these objects to know anything about that? I can start by answering, and hopefully Daryl can chime in as well. I think that. Our best data, of course, for all of the minor planets of the solar system have come from when we've actually been able to visit them. With interstellar objects, of course, you don't know when they're coming and you don't know from what direction or how quickly they're coming. So getting to them is, of course, much harder than getting to near-Earth objects or any other minor planet in the solar system. But Daryl has actually done a fair amount of work on looking at trajectories to hypothetical interstellar objects and rendezvous, which would be exactly what you would want to get us the type of information that we're looking for about their planetary systems. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, without going as far as organics or amino acids, I mean, one thing, one thing we know is that on Earth itself, the development of life really required the presence of the oceans. And it's a huge open question right now, even how Earth got its oceans in the first place, because we know there's water, but then if you look in more detail, certain properties of the water on Earth don't match with what you'd expect from interstellar gas. So kind of this one hypothesis is that the Earth's oceans itself was delivered from small bodies further out in the solar system. And right now we don't know anything about the volatiles on the dark comets, but you know, an interstellar, before even talking about a mission to an interstellar object, when Hayabusa 2 gets to KY26, if it can measure some of these more difficult to measure properties of any outgassing that's there, that might tell us something that these dark comets actually could have contributed volatiles to the Earth. And then similarly with an interstellar object, I think it's kind of in the same vein. You could, if you learn about volatiles or more in detail of just what type of volatiles there are, but things like isotopic measurements, that could tell you about the, vo the delivery of stuff like water to extrasolar planets. Now, Daryl, you also had advanced the idea of a, a hydrogen iceberg as a potential uh, solution for a Momoa. Do you expect to see things like that? Is that are we going to see things that no one be, or very few people are expecting or predicting with LSST? Is it going to surprise us? <laughs> Well, hopefully I'm going to be pleasantly surprised by whatever LSST finds. But uh, maybe, Garrett, you want to say something to that end? Because Garrett had a very nice paper about kind of quantifying all of the different various hypotheses regarding Oumuamua and what LSST could find. Sure. Yeah, I can, I can chat a little bit about that. I think that the answer to the question, will LSST find something that we haven't thought of? I think the answer is almost assuredly yes. It's it's amazing whenever we turn on some new telescope or some new instrument that looks at the sky in a way that we haven't before. We're, we're always surprised, and we always find it really interesting and incredible things out about the universe, and I'm, I would be surprised if LSST were any different. In terms of the interstellar object hypotheses, yeah, LSST is definitely something that can even, even though Oumuamua is long gone, hopefully shed some light onto what it was either by discovering objects that look similar to Oumuamua, where we're now in the James Webb era, 
better equipped to look for hydrogen per se or nitrogen outgassing per se and also just to understand what the population level statistics of these objects are and to understand like whether there are enough objects or too many of these objects to satisfy any of the could it be hydrogen could it be nitrogen could it be something else hypotheses lsst is really going to give us a better grasp of the population of these objects and tell us well how much stuff does the galaxy actually have to put into interstellar objects and that that number in itself will help us constrain what things like Oumuamua might be made of. Yeah, and another, if you don't mind me tagging on, another kind of weird thing is Garrett already talked about how it looks like there's a continuum between comets and asteroids and the solar system objects, but you have this continuum of activity in the interstellar objects, Oumuamua and Borisov. But Garrett kind of hit the nail on the head. It's like what you really want to know is what the population level is like. So how many inactive interstellar objects are there compared to active ones and the thing is if an object has a dust coma it gets way brighter so it should be much easier to see so the fact i mean what is it i mean we don't know right now because it's such only two objects but how many comets like borisov are there out there in the galaxy compared to how many Oumuamua like objects that would be something uh really important that lsst is going to be able to answer any hope on determining the ages of these? I mean, we're not going to really be able to figure out the actual origin. We'll just know about the environment, but we won't be able to pin this on a star, most likely, any of these objects. But is there the information preserved on the age of the object? Can we can we sort of try to figure that out based on what we see with the uh, observations? Yeah, I can speak a little bit about that. That's something that you can learn at kind of a statistical level because of the the velocities at which we encounter these objects. So after interstellar objects are ejected from their host stars and they become interstellar, they travel around the Milky Way and they encounter things like molecular clouds and spiral arms. And so over time, their velocities speed up. And so just in the same way that younger stars don't move very fast compared to the sort of mean motion of everything around them, Younger interstellar objects should also move slower, and therefore older interstellar objects should be moving faster. And so, again, something that we would like to do or something that we could do in the LSST era is start to understand whether the statistics of the interstellar object velocities look like the statistics of the stellar velocities. And by that, we can say, well, the average interstellar object might be younger, might be older, and those kinds of constraints can help us to understand those population level questions that we're really after. So yeah, that's definitely something that we're really interested in the ages of interstellar objects and something that LSST will definitely open up for us. And then the idea, hopefully, if we get enough of these is you combine that information with the compositional information, and then you get a better sense of what types of stars are these coming from, these objects coming from, and whereabouts did they form within those? Now, is it possible for, say, Jupiter to capture an interstellar object? In other words, could there be interstellar objects sitting in the solar system that were captures, or are they just moving too fast for even Jupiter to do it, or the sun? So, in theory, it's possible, because, I mean, if an interstellar, if an interstellar object just passes through the solar system and the solar system is just the sun, then it just passes through and nothing happens. It is possible that something like Jupiter or Saturn could deflect an interstellar object in such a way to keep it bound in the solar system. There have been some pretty detailed studies over the last couple of years. I think Kevin Napier and Tom Hands both had a couple sets of papers on this because it's a difficult question because you have to really numeric views computers and simulate huge numbers of potential interstellar objects and how they can get captured and they also can get re-ejected so the answer turns out that there is likely very little captured bound interstellar objects in the solar system in any given time at a steady state so you are much more likely to see an interstellar object coming from interstellar space than one captured in the solar system now, Garrett, with the LSST, the telescope, 
That is going to produce an enormous amount of data. It's looking at the sky constantly each night. And that's just going to produce an enormous amount of data. What is the amount of data that you're going to have to deal with? And what methods are you going to use to process and take a look at it? Yeah. So the LSST is going to produce around 15 terabytes of data per night, which is just an astounding amount of data. And it's something that I think is one of the really fundamental parts of how the survey is going to work is there's not only the physical engineering of building this amazing machine, the telescope, but there's also this, all of the data management and the data processing and how do we even move that amount of data around the world to astronomers that there's been a lot of hard work by a lot of people that has gone into this. And it's really a, an effort that is going to really, it's essential for the survey to work. So the way that it's going to work is, at least on the short time scale, there's going to be what's called an alert stream. So the data are going to be processed by these uh, LSST brokers per se, and they're going to get the alerts, which are basically the, the survey saw something that was not there when it looked a couple of nights ago. So that could be a supernova, that could be an asteroid, that could be anything that moves basically or anything that changes. And then those alerts are going to be disseminated to the community through these brokers so that people like Daryl and me don't have to parse 15 terabytes of data per night. That's not something that we can do on our laptops or probably even on our university clusters. It would They would charge us a lot of money to do that. And so it's really a, an effort for the sort of by the community for the community and it's that alert stream that is going to enable us to parse all of this data and do all of the follow-up that we want to do when we discover interstellar objects, for example, or when the supernova community sees us an exciting supernova event. It's all going to go through these brokers and through this really well thought out data infrastructure that accompanies the physical survey, the telescope on the ground. Yeah, we have this LSST solar system science collaboration that Meg Schwann is leading. Me and Gary both, you know, routinely go to stuff with them. And really, it's we've come together as a big community trying to figure out, you know, when all of this data is coming down, how do we make sure that we can take advantage of the data? And, you know, if an interstellar object is moving really fast, how do we make sure that we adequately can find that? Because that's actually pretty difficult to find so that everybody in the community can then go and look at it and follow it up. Is there any possibility of citizen science here? In other words, if you need computing power, many years ago SETI did this, SETI at home, where they used the collective power of people's computers as you know, screensavers to calculate and process their data. Is there any possibility for this? If, if the data starts getting backed up, could you employ citizen science to help process it? I think there definitely is. And there are people in the solar system science collaboration who are already talking about set how we would go about setting that up because we want to set that up in a way that's most efficient for the citizen scientists. So I think there is a huge amount of interest from our astronomical community to get that going. And based on previous community science, citizen science efforts with things like Galaxy Zoo or searching for exoplanets, we already know that citizen science is really important for dealing with data sets and looking for interesting things. So I think that's something that we as astronomers really want to happen and to foster. Now, what about when you, you know, when you do things like that, you can sometimes get people misinterpreting data. And if you, an object that isn't quite, and this was actually a problem with Kepler, where not every object can be looked at or studied because nobody has infinite time. How do we combat misinfo when people see something about an object, a known object that isn't really accurate? Yeah, I think that's that's a really tough question and something I've been working on a lot recently. And what one thing that I'm a little concerned about is what if, you know, best case scenario, we find tons of interstellar objects and it turns out LSST is really great at finding these things. And we've got so many that we can't even follow them all up. What if... Uh, you know, a lot of them have mysterious non-gravitational accelerations and we don't know what's going on. I think what's we're going to be really important is for us as a community and also the citizen scientists not to jump to conclusions without getting ample data on the object. So I think we really need to kind of come together as a community and these interesting weird objects that show up. I mean, Garrett was already talking about 
anytime you turn on a new telescope or a new survey, you always find weird stuff. That's kind of what pushes science forwards, but it's also really important that we find the weird objects in, in real time and then we follow them up so we get more data on them so that we can say what they are and not be left in this mysterious limbo with a muamua coming through and we weren't able to detect any outgassing on it and we're still arguing about what the object was. And may never know. muamua has gone and I mean, there are ideas to catch up with it and all that, but it's gone. But at the same time, you would think that we should see a population of them, right? In other words, we should see Oumuamua-like behavior in some of these objects, right? Absolutely. Like we've seen Oumuamua-like behavior in the dark comets, it, although it's not exactly the same behavior. I imagine that we'll find more interest. I'm sure we'll find more interstellar objects like Oumuamua, but we'll be able to follow them up. So I think it's really important that we follow them up and get better observations of the objects so that there's no misinformation going around about what these weird you know, it, it could be scary. You know, you've got a lot of stuff coming from outside of the solar system and we want to figure out what it is. And scientifically, they could tell us so much about planetary systems and exoplanets throughout the galaxy. We really have to take advantage of it, but they come and leave. So we have to do it in real time and quickly. Yeah, but the payoff, you know, like you said, the payoff of understanding star formation and, you know, uh, protoplanetary disks and all that in, in star systems other than this one is pretty amazing but it'll also tell us a lot about this one too now garrett what's it like within the lsst community what's the temperature of all of the the uh, scientists working in within it yeah i, I think as i alluded to before with the, the just the vast amount of data that's going to come down i think people have really realized that we're really good when we come together as a community and we do our best science that way when we can figure out the best processes to analyze 15 terabytes of data per night and <laughs> so many petabytes of data over the course of the survey. There's really a lot of data and we all need to participate and we all can contribute to sort of advancing science forward. And that's what's that's what's really exciting to me. So I, I think the temperature is just that everyone's very eager and excited for this telescope to turn on and see what see what we see and working really hard to make sure that we do see what we see. Right. All right, gentlemen, this is probably the most exciting telescope that we we have coming. And it actually excited me even more than JWST did before it launched. Yeah, and that's same. saying a lot, you know, because <laughs> I mean, look at JWST. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, gentlemen. And uh, I hope we come back and check back in as we get closer to first light of the Vera Rubin Observatory. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.